the church said, praise the Lord. All right, we'll try it again. And the church said, praise the Lord. God bless you real good. We're so excited to be here in worship. My name is Ricky, and on behalf of our whole team, thank you so much for being with us today. Most of you call this place home. Others of you were pulled out of bed kicking and screaming by someone who does call this place home, and we're very grateful that you are with us today. Um, How about the staff team of Southwest, the discipleship team in particular, who has been loving on these graduates and just equipping them in the faith? Would you give it up for Pastor Kim Harrell and Shannon and Tom? And all of the leaders on our discipleship team that have done so well, folks, rooted is the fat of our bat. We ask for a 10-week sacrifice because we want to make sure that our people understand what it is we believe and teach and why we believe and teach it. So I hope that this has touched some of your hearts to say, you know what, I need to do rooted. The next one is coming up later in January, so we hope you'll pay attention to our website because we would love to get you rooted in the gospel as well. Y'all ready to go ahead and get to work this morning? Okay, Notre Dame won last night 44 to nothing. Just thought you would just thought you would want to know that. USC did win by the skin of their teeth, but they're facing a, a real team next week, so let's be in prayer. Should I not have said that? Okay, all right, even though I believe that in my heart. Anyways, let's go ahead. If you have your Bibles, meet me in Galatians chapter 5, uh, verses 16 and 17. Galatians chapter 5. Verses 16 and 17. Put your finger uh, where we'll land the balance of our time in John chapter 16. We'll pick up in the middle of verses 4 uh, through 11. And if you're new to us, we have been for weeks now trekking through the letter of Galatians as we have been uh, calling this series the Gospel of Galatians, whereby the Apostle Paul, watch this now, is saying to the church that if you truly and authentically have put your trust in in your faith, in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so far, watch it. He has died for you. He was buried for you. He has been risen again for you. Paul is writing the entire letter to say that if you've truly put your faith in that Savior, your goose is cooked. You are saved. You are delivered. You are free. You are on your way to heaven. There is no devil in hell that can stop you. You are free in Jesus. You don't have to work for your freedom because the good news of the gospel is someone has worked for you. You don't have to work to keep your freedom because someone else has worked for you. Paul is saying, as my grandmama would say, if your faith be in Jesus, you are show enough free. That's the gospel of Jesus. And as we started a couple of weeks ago, we tiptoed into chapter 5, where Paul is now trying to give, if you will, the secret sauce. In other words, the Galatians are probably begging the question, if I'm free, how now do I live it if I don't have to necessarily live it perfectly in order to be free? This is a disconnect for me, Paul. So then the Apostle Paul says, you ought to walk by the Spirit of the living God. What's the crux of his message? Here it is. The same God who saved you is the same God who gives you power to live saved. Same God who has saved you. That's the good news of the gospel. Who has saved you now says, I'm not going to leave you to yourself to live for yourself or by yourself. I will, Ephesians chapter 1, I will put the very spirit, my spirit on the inside of you. And the old folks used to say, and he walks with me and he talks with me along life's narrow way. It means that the Holy Spirit is with us to help us live. Stay with me in the classroom for a few minutes. I promise we're going to church. And yes, I did wear cowboy boots intentionally, pray for me. Uh, The other thing that the Apostle Paul does is he says we ought to walk by the Spirit, which means that we need to kind of enter into this conversation as to what it means to walk by the Spirit. So a couple of weeks ago, we said, first thing, if you're going to understand the Holy Spirit, is you got to understand who he is. Remember the big picture lesson a couple of weeks ago? It was this. The first incumbent lesson you've got to embrace if you're going to journey with the Spirit of God is to understand that the Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is not an it. That's your first lesson because you've got to understand that when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, we're not talking about an it. We are talking about a he. He meaning he is the very God of the universe. He is the Holy One of Israel. Translation, put some spec on his name. We're not the church who says it. it, it, The Holy Spirit is not a force. The Holy Spirit is not not mojo. The 
Holy Spirit is not a magic trick. The Holy Spirit is not your conscience. He is the God of heaven. So we're not going to be the church who's on Family Feud saying, Holy Spirit, activate. Holy Spirit, act. no, 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 no. It's the Holy Spirit who comes to you, child of God, and says, now, you activate and be holy. You activate and raise up children to the admonition. You activate and steward your money the way that is God honoring. The Holy Spirit is all that and more. So he is a person. He is the living God. Now, and so far we beg the question, who he is. Now we've got to answer this question, what does he do? In other words, how does the Holy Spirit function in every believer's day-to-day life, okay? We're all going to leave here today, okay? We're going to go have lunch, go to Cork and Fork. Make sure you get the filet mignon tacos. They're street tacos. They have pickled onions with them. They have just a little splash of jalapeno, a pesto sauce that's amazing. Go talk to Mike and Andy. They're the chefs. They live right around the corner. Tell them Ricky sent you. It's going to be delicious. And if you don't have time to that, go to Raising Cane's. The chipotle sauce is amazing. Make sure you get something called the Caniac Combo. It will bless your soul. But then after that, you're going to clock into work tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., and you can expect the Holy Spirit to be with you tomorrow. Some of you couples, you're going through a tough time in your marriage right now, and you can expect the Holy Spirit to show up at the next conversation. Some of you are having a tough season with that kid right now. Can I get an uncircumcised Philistine witness out here? Oh, come on, parents. That was your time to release that pain in Jesus' name. That crumb snatching booger is just... Amen. What can you expect the Holy Spirit to do? That's the question that the answer comes from our text today. In other words, we would do well to talk about all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but today I'm going to talk about the two gifts that everybody gets, okay? So we could talk about healing. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. We could talk about faith. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. We could talk about tongues, right? Mama say, mama say, mama. We could talk about all that stuff. Okay, is that too far? Is that too far? Should I not have done that? Anyways. I don't know. I can't tell who I've offended. I'm sorry. But anyways, we, we could talk about all those things, but I want to talk about what everybody has. That, well, there's no differentiation in the body of Christ. Paul and Jesus say it is you can expect the Holy Spirit's comfort and you can expect his conviction. Go now with me to the text where Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, just verses 16 through 17, Paul says, but I say walk by the Spirit and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. Look at verse 17, Okay. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are, key word, he says, your flesh and the spirit are opposed to each other, okay, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Now, go with me to the words of Jesus, John chapter uh, 16. This is really cool because Jesus is hours away from the crucifixion. It's a section of scripture scholars call the farewell discourse. Jesus is about to get pulled out of the Garden of Gethsemane. on his way to, to be killed on the cross. He's about to die, watch this, the most tumultuous death in human history. And yet the words of John 16 expose that the Savior is way less concerned about the death he's about to die and way more concerned about the life he wants his children to live. John has captured the episode. He writes to us these words. Jesus is talking and he says to us, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Look at this phraseology. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer concerning judgment because, key phrase, the ruler of this world is judge. Good morning, everybody. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 17, chapter 16 of John, verses 4b through 11. I read from the greatest book ever written. I bear witness this day. All of its words are true. Amen? Amen. Talking about the Holy Spirit and what he does, how I can expect him to show up in my life uh, each and every day. Paul's talking about the Holy Spirit. Jesus is talking about uh, the Holy Spirit. Uh, But to kind of wrap our minds around what I think needs to happen before we go, 
Uh, let me remind you of one of my favorite TV shows. Have you guys ever heard of this TV show? Uh, it's on PBS, so you probably haven't heard, heard of it. But um, it's a TV show called Antiques Roadshow. <laughs> Have you heard of this? Show of hands, you heard of this show? I love this show. It's one of my favorite shows. Uh, so essentially what happens is these snooty appraisers um, go all over the world uh, in all of the cities and what happens is we locals come up to these shows and we bring like our little trinket that we picked up at the flea market or something that Big Mama and Medea passed down and, and we take it to these appraisers to see if it's worth some money. So if take for instance, they'll be in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania and this woman comes up there and she's got what she thinks is a saucepan that's tied to a, a broomstick and she'll come up to this snooty Brit Okay, and he'll say, oh, what do, you, what, what do you have here? And she'll say, well, this is a saucepan that my great-grandma passed down to us, and I think they made chili on it. I think they made chili, and I think they put a broom handle because the fires would get out of control. So in order to not get burnt, they put a broom handle on it, and they would stick the chili over in the fire. And he, he looks at her with that snooty Brit look, and he, no offense to the Brits here, just all the other ones. But... Um, uh, <laughs> He, he looks back at her and he says, Madam, that is actually a bed warmer. It's a bed warmer. That's 17th century, I believe. It was made by uh, the royal blacksmith of Her Majesty, uh, uh, Mary of Scots. And uh, it was passed down to the Duchess of York. And you'll be very surprised to know this is an absolute authenticated, rare bed warmer. And I'm happy to let you know, Madam, it is worth $1,800. And she looks, and she's really shocked, but she got to keep her composure. So she looks back at him and says, oh, well, that's about what I figured. Knowing good and well, she's about to take every $1,800 and buy lottery tickets and rosé. You know what I'm saying? So, so that's Antiques Roadshow. Uh, greatest episode ever. Uh, YouTube this later, two years ago. Happened in a town um, of West Fargo, uh, North Dakota. Beautiful city. Okay? I have no idea. I've never been there. Anyways, West Fargo, North Dakota, and a place called Bonanzaville, the Bonanzaville Museum. And so the scene is one of this uh, Air Force veteran, military veteran, right? And so he comes to this particular appraiser, and he tells them the story of how back in Thailand in 1972, he buys this Rolex. It was a used Rolex, and of course, the appraiser just kind of mystified by it. He's got the original watch that's in pristine condition. He's got all the original receipts, and the box, and of course, the appraiser was just engaged, wanting to hear the story. He says, I picked it up for $350, which seemed to me that was a lot of money back in 1972, and the appraiser's saying this and saying that, and he says, hey, it's been in a box for 50 years. I've never, ever touched it. I've never used it. I just figured, hey, I'll just keep it to the side, and I'll just say, I forgot I had it, and so I just wanted, I said, hey, I heard y'all come to town. I may as well see what it's worth. Now, the appraiser, who is, of course, a snooty appraiser, says, sir, you don't know what you've brought into me today, and of course, he goes through the whole rigmarole of the story. This was actually a rare piece, and they, they only made this many of them, and it's actually a signature on the back, you know, all, all, all the things, and then he comes to the guy and says, sir, I'm happy to let you know that your watch is worth 700 thousand dollars. He literally fell down. There's a picture of him. Like, he fell down. <laughs> he, he fell down because in a word from the appraiser, he heard that his whole life had changed. Now, here's the lesson. His problem was not that he never had a treasure. His problem was that for 50 years, he kept his treasure in a box. As we come to our passage, there's an appraiser named Jesus talking who says, I'm sending you a treasure. And the problem for my people will not be that they don't have a treasure. The problem will be if they leave him in a box. I, I want to talk to you about what the Holy Spirit does in our life. And in so doing, I want to challenge you before we leave today let him out of the box. I want to talk about how he comforts. I want to talk to us about how he convicts. So doing, I want to put a tag on this text, the Holy Spirit, his work. Let's pray. Jesus, got about 15, 20 minutes, but thy will be done. Would you answer our prayers, Lord, this week that you would speak to every soul and every circumstance in this room? God, in such a way that the name of Jesus, 
hallelujah, would be high and lifted up that will draw all men and women and boys and girls to his name. God, bring revival. In Jesus' name we pray. Every heart said? Amen. Amen. Y'all have read of a few minutes of church today? Okay. All right. Um, three of us, I'll take it. Okay. Um, let's go to the classroom for just a few moments. Don't have the time to, to exegete this passage the way that we are accustomed to. However, there are a few highlights that I think are incumbent upon us, especially in the way of what we can call, hear it now, the big picture lesson of what we've just read in the scripture. Now, I say that because there are words here. Paul is saying flesh against the spirit, spirit against the flesh. They are opposed to each other. Then Jesus is kind of heavy handed, is he not? Convict you of sin and convict you of righteousness and convict you of judgment. Heavy handed text. But remember, there's always a big picture lesson that the spirit of God has inspired for the passage. So if there was one thing that I would have you guys take away from the day as to what Jesus is saying when he's saying that my spirit is coming, this is the celebration you need to take home today. Here it is. Jesus is saying, because of the Holy Spirit, we are never alone. That's what he's saying. Don't overthink it. Don't trip out. He's saying we are never alone. Um, you'll have no idea how much this staff enjoys praying for you. You have no idea the gift you've given us to weep in prayer. For the sheep, it is the honor of our lives to get on bended knee and petition God's throne for you. And some of you came today, and this is the one line you came for. You are not alone. It's scary out there, and it's getting scarier. It's dark out there, and it's getting darker. Can I do one more? It's weird out there. Can I get a TikTok witness? And it's getting weirder. But children of God, Jesus says, if I do not go away, the helper cannot come. Translation, Jesus in many ways is saying to the disciples, it will be even better for you that I've put my spirit on the inside of each and every one of you because it means even when family turns their back on you, when work turns their back on you, when the culture turns their back on you, there is a God who sees you, who loves you. He will never turn his back on you. You will never be alone. You will never be left to the wolves. You will never be alone. And we got to go through some stuff this next 5, 10, 15 years. And I'm just telling you, we're not going to be doomsday, but it doesn't look rosy and peachy and keen. And it's trepid. It causes trepidation for us. And I know, I know how you feel, but God is saying to this church, it is your first rodeo. It is not mine. I have taken care of my people since day one. Surely I will take care of them now. We are not alone. We will win. That's the gospel. And this is what Jesus is celebrating in the text, that we are never alone. Now, precisely, why do I get to say that as if it were true, which it absolutely is? It's because Jesus is saying the first thing the Holy Spirit is going to do in your life every day is this. He's going to comfort you. He's going to comfort you. And y'all, you just came for this line. Here it is. There is no greater comfort than the comfort that the Spirit of the living God has for you. That's what I want you to tag your soul to today is that there is no greater comfort, so much so that Jesus is saying in the text, it's to your advantage that I go away so that the helper will come. What's the lesson? Jesus is saying to the disciples that what I've done for you 12 in the natural, the Holy Spirit will do for all believers in the supernatural for all times until Jesus Christ returns. It is Jesus promising us that I know the world is dark. I know there's chaos and fear, and this is what I'm going to do about it. I myself, through the presence and power of the Spirit, will indwell your heart. And when you don't know what to say, I'm going to help you with what to say. And when you don't know what to do, I'm going to show you what to do. And when you don't know how to act, I'm going to show you how to act. You will never be alone because the Holy Spirit comforts us. Now, let's go to the classroom, then we'll go to church. Uh, Jesus says, if I don't go away, uh, the helper will not come. It should be capitalized in most of your Bibles. In some of your Bibles, it's the word counselor. In others, it's the word uh, assistant. Um, some of you have the King James Bible, which is the real Bible. Okay. 
I'm, I'm kidding. But anyways, in, in your King James, it says comforter, okay? Comforter. Jesus is speaking of the Spirit in his inherent nature as a comforter. Now, if I had the time, I'd shout because the God of heaven who created heaven and earth, who flung out trillions of stars and billions of galaxies across an expanse of the universe. Hallelujah, the great God of heaven who has all power, see, is still humble enough to call himself a helper. If I had a shouting church, you would have shouted. What's the point? He's big and bad. He ain't got to humble himself to do nothing. Yet in his inherent nature and his love for his children, he says, I won't just command you. I'll also help you through life. That's the good news. Now, underline the word helper. It's the Greek word parakletos. Parakletos. P-A-R-A-kletos. That's how you spell it. Parakletos is the word from which we derive our English word paraclete. Para, prefix, meaning to come alongside. Clete meaning an aid or an assistant, okay? Now, Jesus is saying that the Holy Spirit is a paraclete, which technically means one who comes alongside you and brings you aid. That's all it means. Paraclete is the one who comes alongside you and brings you aid. Now, here's why this preaches. Jesus is not calling him a clete. He's calling him a paraclete. I guess that was just good to me. Okay. Here's what I mean. If he was just a cleat, which is an aid or a helper, he'd stand at a distance outside the ditch, outside the hospital bed, outside the wayward child, outside the bank told you no, outside the you can't find a job, and he would throw help, and he would throw scriptures, and he would throw encouragements, and he would say, hang out there in the ditch and figure it out. I'll be out here when you work your way out. No, 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 no. I'm so glad my Bible says he is a paraclete. Oh, God, which means he doesn't stand on the outside of the situation. Can I get a witness that you was in a ditch one time and Jesus himself came up into the situation and put his arms around you and said, we're going to make it through this thing. I need to calm down. I need to calm down. But he's a paraclete who comes alongside you. And I heard the old folks sing the song, he walks with me. And he talks with me along life's narrow way. Now, I'm getting fuzzy looks. So you're saying, Ricky, I have no idea what a paraclete is, and I get that. So maybe you've not heard of paraclete, but perhaps you've heard of a paramedic. A paramedic is one whom you are in physical encumbrance, comes alongside you and brings you. Okay, not, no one knows what a paramedic is, so maybe uh, you know what a paralegal is. Paralegal, if you're a missed court proceedings, comes alongside you and you bring, no, no, no one knows what a paralegal is. Maybe, maybe, maybe you know what a paratrooper is. A paratrooper swoops down and they help you fight. No, no. Well, no one's heard of a paramedic. Apparently, no one's heard of a paralegal. No one's heard of a paratrooper, but everybody's heard of a parachute. And a parachute keeps you from crashing. And I heard you say, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. The Holy Spirit is all that and more in your life. Amen? Give it up for the, parrot, for the cleat. And the crux of the text is Jesus is saying, disciples, everything you've seen me do for three years, the Spirit will do supernaturally through all believers, which is Jesus' way of saying Everything that I've done for you, you can expect the Spirit for you. Why? Because it's one God. So everything Jesus did for the disciples, the Spirit will do for me. So when we look at John 13 through 17, we see that for the disciples, Jesus served them. The God of the universe put on slave clothes and bent down on his knees and washed the disciples' feet. Jesus gave them hope, 14.1. He said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus gives us direction, so the Holy Spirit will give us direction. It was Thomas in chapter 14, verse 6, who says, Lord, how can we know the way to which Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus brings growth. John 14, 26, he said, the Spirit will teach you all things. 
Jesus promised them, peace, peace I live with you, leave with you, 1427. Not as the world gives peace. Romans 8, 18, I can hear Paul say that I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and minds through Christ Jesus. Philippians 3, 13, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended it, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me and reaching forth to those things which are before, I pray towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Can I get a get in your Bible witness so when you're in the ditch, that word can come alive. The Spirit does that in us. That felt good. But let's do something that we need that's not gonna feel good but will mean us good. Y'all trust me? Okay? Don't trust me, just trust this book. Okay? This is what we need to hear, because I'm telling you, this messed me up all week, and it still is. But here's my encouragement, friends. Lean into the comfort the Spirit has for you, not the world's comfort Satan uses against you. Is that okay? I think some of us need to hear this, because I think we Christians, um, we church-attending Christians, we Bible-reading, Bible-believing Christians. We Chris Tomlin, K-Love, loving Christians. We Joyce Meyer, Bobblehead, Beth Moore t-shirt Christians. We Joel Osteen, David Jeremiah Christians. We can sometimes be guilty of allowing our hurts and our wounds to be ministered to not a Holy Spirit cocktail, but a flesh and spirit cocktail. We can be guilty of allowing the Holy Spirit to comfort us on Sunday, let something else comfort us on Monday. Who am I talking to? Don't say amen or we'll know it's you. <laughs> We're all guilty of allowing the Holy Spirit to fill up a third of our tank and then going to some other sources to allow the, the Satan and allow the world and allow secularism to comfort us the rest of the way. And this is what you need to hear. There is no true comfort other than the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Everyone looking this way. The Spirit is good enough for you. The Spirit is satisfaction enough for you. Amen, somebody? Amen. Now, where is he going? Is he preaching religion? He just spent 17 weeks saying it's not about religion. Is he preaching Putting a Pharisaic requirement on us? No, not at all. We're free in Christ, so chill, okay? But some of us, let me kind of put out some examples, okay? Some of us, you know, and hey, you ain't gonna hear Ricky trip on a glass of Cabernet. <laughs> Low key, you know, anyway, they ain't going there. But you're never gonna hear me trip on that. Sauvignon, okay? Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Noir, all right? Chardonnay, whatever you do, all right? I ain't tripping. You're not gonna hear me tri trip on a glass of wine. For some of us, it's becoming a bottle. For some of us, it's becoming a case. And you're not careful, but you have a flesh and spirit cocktail happen. Can, can, can I go further? You're not going to hear me trip on a cigarette or a cigar. Yeah, it's just not, it's not, I'm not, not going to do it, okay? All right? For some of us, it's become a pack all the time. What is that signaling? What is that indicating? I'm allowing something else to bring me the comfort on the Holy Spirit can. Can I do two more since I wrote them? Okay? You will never see me judge you about comfort food. Okay. <laughs> and Ricky Jenkins said, amen. I got some baby backs thawing out right now in Jesus' name. You ever get in that season, though, where comfort food becomes a comfort buffet? And your spirit is believing that when I feel full, I am full. You know I can preach to that? <laughs> can I do one more? Spirit ain't worried about you spending a little money. Go to TJ Maxx. Black Friday is coming. I got stuff in my cart now. <laughs> Waiting for my 30% off. You can judge me all you want to. That pergola is coming to Indio, California in two weeks. And Jesus, ain't nobody tripping. <laughs> Credit cards maxed out? You can't buy the things you need because you keep buying the things you want? That's flesh. That's the spirit. Now, 
brings us to our last point. Don't you understand that it's just as good news that the Spirit comforts? It's also that he convicts. <laughs> he convicts. He convicts. <laughs> he convicts. He convicts. I forgot the props again, so I got to go over here. So. The other gift of the Spirit is conviction. Everybody say that. Conviction. Say it one more time. Conviction. Outside of the lawn, say it one more time. Conviction. And I want you to see it as a, that's the point before we go home. Conviction is good. Now, why am I going through the rigmarole on this? Because no one feels like conviction is a gift. And everybody said, amen. No one even wants the next five minutes. I don't want it. So I know you don't. No one wants to talk about conviction. No one's going home today to see their girlfriend and say, girl, you should have been at church today, girl. Ooh, girl, what did he talk about? Girl, he talked about conviction. Ooh, girl, you got another church I can go to? <laughs> Nobody wants to talk about conviction. Y'all know how we got all the Christian t-shirts now? And you've seen the t-shirts that say, you know, too blessed to be stressed. And what would Jesus do? You know, and real men pray and all these other t-shirts. You ain't never in your life seen a Christian t-shirt that says, convicted. <laughs> you ain't never seen that, okay? <laughs> sermons on conviction don't pack churches. But I'm a firm believer that sermons on conviction pack heaven. And that's why we need to talk about it. Amen? Amen. All right, write this stuff down. And um, if not, just email me and I'll send it uh, to you. That's a joke. <laughs> trying to buy time. Okay, conviction. Uh, outside of regeneration, which is when you put your trust in Jesus and the Spirit literally makes you alive. He changes your status from darkness to light. And he says, she gets to go to heaven because she's put her faith in Jesus. Outside of regeneration, the best thing the Spirit's gonna do for you is convict you. It's a Greek word, elenko. Okay, E-L-E-N-C-H-O, elenko. It means to expose it means to blame. It means to reprove. What is it literally? What is Elenko? It is literally a bad feeling that the Holy Spirit induces in your spirit. Watch this. And he leaves it there until you get that thing right with the Lord. Elenko is when, when, when the Spirit says, they're veering away from the path. And he calls this, watch the old preacher used to say it this way, a soul level disturbance that he doesn't let up. Now, you know why I had to go to this little cute, cute, you know, all this stuff? It's because you got to see that not as anger. You got to see that as kindness. Because when the Holy Spirit convicts you, it's his way of saying, you are my child. And in this decision you just made, you may be giving up on me but I'm not going to give up on you. I have sealed you, and I've promised Philippians 1, 6, that he that has begun a good work in you is able to complete it to the day of Jesus Christ. You may act like a fool today, but I'm gonna act like a God who loves fools today, and I'm going to make you aware, and I'm gonna stay on you because your destiny is bigger than this day. Your future is bigger than this mistake. I've got a plan for you, and even if you get sideways with the plan, I won't get sideways with my plan. I will convict you. It's a gift, y'all. It's a gift from God that he would convict us. What does it do? It points believers away from sin and towards repentance. So notice Jesus says he'll convict us concerning sin, concerning righteousness, concerning judgment. Judgment because of the rule of this world. Let's reverse engineer. Anybody tired of bad men getting away with murder and rape and incest and molestation and stealing from the poor? Can I get a witness right there? Anybody tired on social media because it seems like the, the, the fools and the wicked Seems like they're growing richer and more powerful, and it just seems like us normal folks that's in the middle are just trying to eke out a living. Can I get a witness that politicians have lost their mind? Can I get a witness that the economy has lost? Y'all ain't acting right, but I'll preach to myself. Ricky, can you get a witness to yourself that it's crazy out there, and it seems as if nobody cares, but Jesus says the Spirit will remind the believer that the ruler of this world will be judged. You may get away today, but the trump of God is going to blow. 
hey, God and the King of Kings shall come back and make everything right with the world. We can be assured of that through the Spirit. He says, also concerning sin, translation, he convicts you when you've done something you shouldn't have done. So it's like a couple of weeks ago when I woke up with what I like to call daditude. <laughs> you've heard of bad attitude? Dads, this is when we have daditude, okay? I was hot. I was bothered. I was tired. I was exhausted. Been working every day, just tired and fed up, stressed out. 5 a.m., my children come and jump on my throat at 5 a.m. They're just playing, and their lives are perfect because they ain't got no problems. So I got problems, and they're just, oh, Dad, oh, Dad, everything's perfect. Oh, Dad, oh, Dad, oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness. And I'm just like, oh, and I'm like, sit down, shut up, quit. You know, and I'm just, just hot and bothered. I'm like, get over there, grab something, can something, no, no, no. And I'm just that person for 20 minutes. Then we have family prayer. And it's Grandy's turn, and Grandy says, Jesus, please make Daddy happy again. <laughs> Alenko! And I have to go to my six-year-old and say, son, Daddy was out of line. I was loud and I was wrong, son. And I had a bad week, and I took it out on you, son. Would you forgive me? Yeah, Daddy, I forgive you, you know. Concerning sin, but also concerning righteousness. Translation, he shows you what you need to do. In other words, you ain't done nothing wrong. He's just putting something on you. <laughs> saying, hey, you know what? I want you to do this. So it's like when your friend, uh, they call you like, man, what's up, dude? What you doing? It's like, nothing, man. What's going on? He's like, man, we're getting ready for the weekend. I said, oh, dude, that's what's up. What y'all going to do? He's like, well, man, what, 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 what about you? We're trying to, trying to put something together. Uh, what, what, what you got going on Saturday? I said, man, I ain't got nothing going on Saturday. What y'all got going on? I was like, well, hey, man, can you help me move? Now, can we first of all agree that those people are evil? <laughs> they are not a God, and they deserve to be slapped. Can we just agree there first? Can we agree to that? And you're like, no, you didn't, because now you can't lie, right? They just got you. He's like, oh, okay. <sighs> and then you think about all the times they helped you move. And all the time somebody else helped you move. And you say yes, because he's concerned. This is when you're driving past the homeless person on the corner and something's saying, hey, you know, it's just, you're going. But you got an eight-year-old and a six-year-old and a four-year-old who you have been on broken record saying, we need to help people when they're in need. And you drive by. And they say, Dad, you just drove by that guy. He had a sign that said he was hungry. That's the Holy Spirit. And you turn that El Dorado Cadillac. <laughs> And you're going to do what you're supposed to do. The Holy Spirit convicts us of all those things. But as we close, the only point is this. It's a gift. Amen. When he's doing that, he's saying, I got, I'm invested in you. I love you. So three things and let's go. Guys, put them on screen because I don't feel like walking back up there. <laughs> Next one, guys. Thanks. Number one, conviction means you belong to God. Conviction means you belong to God. Don't make it bad news. Make it good news. Okay. Hebrews 12, 6 says that he disciplines those he loves, okay? Look at conviction as kind of like a check engine light. And when the check engine light comes on, you're like, oh, man, what have I done to my car? And that's, I, I get that. But check engine light means that the good news is that you have an engine. <laughs> so when the Holy Spirit convicts you, I know it feels bad, but his way of saying, hey, you've got a heart, that's sold out for Jesus deep down in there. And I want to get it back on track. Amen? It means you believe that you, that you um, belong to God. Number two, believers eventually run towards conviction, not away from it. So Paul says in Romans that if you can keep on moving away from sin and never respond, Paul warns that you may not be saved. Now, he's not saying you're going to be perfect, but it's his way of saying that on some level, if you truly are in Christ, you cannot rest with conviction. And if you can rest, that may be Jesus saying, you actually need to examine whether or not you truly know me. Native Americans used to say the heart was a circle, and inside the circle was a triangle with sharp edges. And whenever you veered from the righteous path, it would turn and cause pain. And the pain was to wake you up to say, oh, I've gotten off the path, let me get back on the path. They said, but if you kept ignoring it and it kept turning, those sharp edges would dull. And over time, you just have a triangle spinning in your heart because you're not listening. Some of us are here today and 
We're just spinning. And Jesus may be saying to you, you need to actually reconsider whether or not you truly belong to the Lord and give your life to him, okay? All right? Thirdly and finally, conviction means you may look bad, but it makes God look good. I'm calling you to embarrassment for Christ's sake. We're Christians, y'all. We're not like them. We'll, we'll let the world call us fools so that they may see a true gospel witness. That's what we do. That's what we are. And there will be moments where the Holy Spirit will simply, literally set you up to do something that will look like a fool to your friends, a fool to your family, a fool to the world. Show enough a fool at your job. You do what God tells you to do. It may make you look bad, but it makes God look good. It's part of his job is to set you up to do things that the world says is crazy. I was walking in San Diego this last week and I was on my little two, three mile walk and the spirit, I was just praying and the spirit said, pick up the garbage. I said, what? <laughs> the spirit said, pick up the garbage. I'm just, and I'm, first of all, and I'm, I'm, at, I'm at a resort. So it's just like, they should pick it up themselves, you know, <laughs> but it, I, I couldn't shake it. And I'm walking in every five, 20 feet, I'm just picking up. And I'm hoping it ain't y'all driving by because I'm picking up beer cans and stuff. So I'm just, <laughs> and I don't know why I did that. And I'm sure everybody's driving by saying, look at this idiot. But I think some of them said, somebody cares. Don't fight that. Amen. So I used to be a Christian rapper. Did y'all know this? It's pretty big time. No, I wasn't big time at all. Okay. But I was a Christian rapper back in the day, in uh, the early 90s. The name of our group was Straight Flavor. <laughs> Living the straight life of Christ with a little flavor. That's how we did it, okay? It was my buddy Albert, my buddy Jamie, and me. And we went, you know, we were kids in high school. So we'd play stadiums and we'd play, no, we wouldn't play stadiums. we we play elementary schools. <laughs> and we go rap for Jesus, right? Um, um, I like thinking about the time when the Lord saved the soul of mine. He pulled the strings and opened the blinds, and now I'm happy and I know I clap in my hands, taking a stand across the land. What flavor you like, man? It's the S T R A flavor for me. Satan kind of harm me because he knows he got the victory. So in the name of Jesus, I'm gonna tell it. So come on, everybody, help me yell it. That was. Hashtag Ricky got bars. Hashtag move over Drake. Hashtag you can see now why we didn't make it big, okay? And we got to go to this high school, uh, go to the elementary. We performed for them. We got permission to get out of school, but we had to be back in two hours. But the vice president was in Jackson, Mississippi that day, and we really wanted to meet the vice president. And so my buddy Albert says, let's act like we are reporters from our high school doing our high school newspaper, and let's try to get in. So we're like, all right. And so we get notepads and stuff. And, you know, we all had on, you know, FUBU sweatshirts, so we looking, you know, so we're coming up. And, and, the, and, the, and the sheriff is like, boys, what's going on here? They're like, sir, we're, you know, we're reporters from my high school. We're trying to get in to meet the vice president. He's like, okay, boys, come on in. And we get to the reception. She's like, well, boys, I don't have your names here. What's going on? And Albert's like, we're, we're reporters from our high school. Albert's need, Albert needs Jesus. And so he's like, we're reporters from our high school, and we come to do report. She's like, okay, well, boys, just stay here. Let me call your principal first. <laughs> so low-key, I'm like, and I'm just like, well, I'm about to go to jail forever, you know? I'm like, let's go. And I was like, so she turns her back to us. She's on, my, on the phone with Mr. Prather, our high school. Yeah, they fine young men here. Okay, okay. Hey, boys, Mr. Prather wants to know your names. I'm like, oh my gosh. And so my buddy Albert Tate, true story. She says, buddy, what's your name? Albert Tate says, Chris Bishop. <laughs> Y'all, true story, I went just like this. <laughs> James Sutton, my buddy. Okay, buddy, what's your name? Joseph Taylor. <laughs> and I'm shaking. And she comes to me. All right, son. What's your name? Ricky Jenkins. <laughs> the, 
And she turns back around, and they're like, what's wrong with you? They, they hit me. And y'all, true story, we ran full speed out of there. <laughs> we get back to my high school. Thank God Mr. Prather thought it was hilarious. And I looked like a fool that day. But I told that story around the world to around believers that it's okay for you to look bad just as long as God looks good Amen. and live for him. You got a treasure, but you got to let him out of the box. Amen? Let's go home. Let's open up our hands like this. If you need prayer today, we'll be up here at the front to one of these tables to the side. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus and that, that triangle's been turning, we'd love to counsel with you to talk to you about what that looks like to walk with Jesus. Until we meet again, thank you for being a great church. Thanks for being brothers and sisters. Thanks for loving on this valley. Thanks for loving on each other. And until we meet again, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon each and every one of you and bring you peace. And we ask this blessing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody.